Hey everyone, and please have some soda and some raisins because today we're gonna put physics to art. Take a transparent bottle of any soft drink or soda and pop in a few resins. After all the foam flows out, you'll see a bizarre dance of resins. The resins follow a cycle of going up and coming down, journeying their way along the bottle. What you just made is a fancy lava lamp for the dinner table. And you can relish on this bad boy for about 30 minutes, after which the resins will keep to the bottom. So what is happening there? How do the resins keep going up and coming down? We try the same with almonds and cashews, but none of them behave the way like resins. All of them sank straight away to the bottom. What's so special about resins? Fizzy drinks have carbon dioxide dissolved inside and bottled under high pressure. The moment you take the cap off, the gas tries to escape by forming bubbles, hence the foam. When you put in the resins, they first sink to the bottom because of gravity. Resins have special V-shaped wrinkles on them, so when they are in the bottom, emerging gas bubbles get stuck to these V-shaped traps. One bubble sticks to another and so on. It's easier for a bubble to follow another bubble's way up than to create its own, much like us humans. So eventually, this resin gets covered with a life jacket of bubbles. These bubbles lift it up to the surface of the drink. Once on the surface, bubbles pop and escape out, dropping the resin behind them back to the bottom. This cycle keeps on repeating until the excess gas has emerged out and the pressure inside is equal to the atmospheric pressure. This trick will work with any such thing which is small, wrinkly and has a density higher than water. This is the reason why almonds and cashews fail to perform because they lack the important wrinkles for the bubbles to get stuck. But the question is, does this lava lamp beat gravity? The theatre of our lives is played on a stage dominated by this one ever-present force, gravity. It came to our notice first when Isaac Newton asked the famous question, why does the apple fall down on earth? It's because everything attracts everything else. However, this attraction is dependent on the masses of the object. The apple falls down on earth because the earth has a much bigger mass than the apple. But things get interesting when you think if an apple falls down on earth, does the moon also fall? The moon is roughly 240,000 miles away from us. It is so far that you can fit in all the planets of the solar system between the earth and the moon. The moon is our only natural satellite, something which orbits the earth naturally. And it is actually constantly falling towards the earth. But why doesn't it hit the earth? Imagine throwing a ball from a very tall tower. The gravity of the earth attracts the ball and the ball falls down on earth. Now imagine throwing it with some horizontal velocity. The ball still falls, only a bit farther. If the earth were flat and you keep increasing the horizontal velocity, the ball would simply land farther and farther away. But because the earth is nearly spherical, if you throw a ball with a great horizontal velocity, it's gonna keep falling and go towards the other side of the planet. At this point, the ball is still falling, but its horizontal velocity is so great that it keeps going around instead. Now you've successfully put this ball to orbit around the Earth, and it will keep going around the Earth if there's nothing to stop or slow down its motion. The Moon is constantly falling towards the Earth, but its horizontal velocity is just right to make it orbit the Earth. The Moon orbits the Earth at roughly 2300 miles an hour and the density of space is one atom per cubic centimeter. This means that there is not enough molecules to slow down the motion of the moon. So does the moon fall? Yes. But does it hit? No, it misses. If the velocity of moon were any greater than what it is, it would eventually escape the earth. Escape velocity means throwing something at such a great velocity that it escapes the gravitational pull, never to come back. The Earth has an escape velocity of 25,000 miles an hour. When rockets are launched, they maintain a thrust to travel at this velocity. This is how they go out from Earth. In fact, missions to space consume more fuel to escape the Earth than to travel from Earth to Pluto. Gravity is bidirectional. When the Earth is pulling on Moon, the Moon is also pulling on Earth. In fact, Moon's gravitational pull is what causes the tides. When gravity comes to fluids, we come across a term called buoyancy. 
Archimedes, the famous Greek mathematician who is also the man behind the phrase Eureka, discovered the law of flotation. Why does a solid float over a liquid? This is because the liquid has more matter per unit volume and hence there is more gravitational pull on it than the solid. Therefore, the liquid being attracted more sinks down and makes the solid float. Oil floats on water because the density of water is greater than oil. Buoyancy is also a property of gases. A candle flame has this kind of shape because warm air has the tendency of rising up. If a candle were lit in zero gravity, its flame would be rather spherical. In microgravity, the cold air does not sink below the hot air and hence the entire flame remains equidistant from the center, forming a sphere. Many species take the advantage of buoyancy to survive. Chrysopelia ornata is the largest species of flying snakes. These snakes change their body shape, making it more aerodynamic and buoyant to glide in the air. But what about our lava lamp? The resin first sink to the bottom. When bubbles stick to it, the average density of the resin plus bubble combination decreases. Eventually, the resin rises to the surface where the bubble pops out. Now, the resin attains its original density and goes back to the bottom. Therefore, this lamp does not beat gravity, it still follows it. Gravity poses some interesting limits on us. For example, the tallest a tree can grow is roughly 400 feet because beyond this height, it's nearly impossible for the capillary force to beat gravity and to transport water to its upper leaves. The tallest a mountain can grow is roughly 15 kilometers. Mountains are formed on huge tectonic plates which are basically floating on molten mantle. If a mountain grows any taller than this, it will have too much weight and will eventually sink to the height of this limit. These limits are dependent on the gravitational pull on the body. Mount Everest would be only 5 mm tall on a neutron star because of the immense gravity of the star. Therefore, no matter how tall you grow, it's very important to be deeply rooted and to be down to earth. And as always, thank you for watching.